All right, welcome to the fourth, third? third or fourth, third edition of the Pacific Town Hall. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about decentralized autonomous organizations and um, everything that's good and bad about them and kind of share stories, share what we think about them and where we think we're headed in the future. Um, we have a lot of people here from the Cardano community and the Catalyst community. Um, hello, Peter. Welcome. And just to kick things off, I'm going to play a short video that captures an experiment that this guy in the community named Ken did with a number of people in the community just to kind of get in one sentence what they think a DAO is. Um, so I just wanted to play that to, for you guys to, to prime the pump and get you thinking about it. Um, can you see in here? Second, what would you answer? Yep. What is a DAO? Now let's see what our friends say. What's your definition of a DAO? My definition of a DAO is a group of people that come together in a decentralized manner to make decisions and change the world in some way. It can be on-chain, it can be off-chain. Um, and I think it's hard because in my mind, there is a strong smart contract on-chain component to DAOs or it's not a DAO. But I think it can also be argued that um, you can have a DAO without the technology piece and argue that the people piece is more important to make decisions together. How would you define a DAO in one sentence? A community or an organization that has a decentralized decision-making and management structure. So what I mean by decentralized is there is... We can't hear it. You muted yourself, so we cannot hear you. Sorry. Everybody essentially has a say similar to a democracy in a sense, but yeah, in, a, in a total blockchain like kind of way. Um, I would say it's a new way for humans to collaborate without having to necessarily trust each other. The idea of a DAO is that it generally marries the possibility that blockchain technology provides with a hope and an inspiration for better, more democratic represent, representative governance of the companies and institutions that really um, manage our lives. So that instead of having external, independent, unaccountable actors making the decisions, it, it's a democratic community of the participants in the institutions that decide how they're run. Felix, in one sentence, what is your definition of a DAO? It's a technical reinterpretation of religion. A technical reinterpretation of religion. So for me, a DAO is basically um, when power over some sort of resource is controlled by a decentralized group of uh, people. So a DAO to me is, um, is an approach where distributed decision-making um, means that uh, decisions are made where there's hopefully very little concentration of power around uh, the decisions that, are, that are, are taking place and that they get executed on uh, so that um, an outcome can come of it that uh, ultimately has been decided upon by the process of distributed decision making. A DAO is a, uh, a single-edged Chinese sword. Give me a second, my, you just blew my mind and I don't even know where to go with it. No, I'm messing up. <laughs> As formally understood, let me, let me start over with the real answer. So when we talk about DAOs, and we talk about autonomous organizations mm -hmm. in the classical definition that's emerged over the last few years. 
that autonomy refers to machines. And I reject that definition straightforward. I, I don't think a group of people can be organized with only input from machines. And I would love to see a world where, where DAO really does emphasize the autonomy of individual people to get stuff done, to live the best life they can. Uh, but it's going to take some really hard work to get there. So for me, it's um, we're all individual entities. We're all operating, doing our own thing together for a common good. And, that, and that's what I believe a DAO whatever the DAO is should help achieve that. Yeah. What a DAO is, is it's a community owned automated business. And that, that can be as complicated as you want. It could be an individual business process. Like all the business does is it has a look at this and then it does something based on that, you know, okay. but it's controlled by the community. So there isn't a CEO, there isn't the, the, the hedge fund manager, you know, anything like that. Instead, there's everyone votes on decisions that are made for that business to do, whether it's adjusting its parameters or whether it's doing something else, you know? Yeah. And really it's just, yeah, it's a community owned automatic process of some kind. Well, that's- All right. So that was a, a short video that was produced pretty recently by Ken from different parts of the community. So I just wanted to share that because I thought that was a really timely video that was released that fit right into this topic. Um, next, I would love to just do a quick breakout room session. Um, and maybe we'll do four breakout rooms. So I'm going to randomly assign people to rooms you're going to match up and then last time we did a little bit of an intro where we talked about who we were and what brought us here and got to know each other a little better as people um i don't want to take 40 minutes to do that with the room so we're going to do a short 10 minute breakout room so in the breakout room if you just kind of introduce who you are what brought you here and then in one sentence or more um what you think a decentralized autonomous organization is about and what interests you about that topic. And then we'll regroup in the main room and we'll have a conversation as a group around that topic. Um, does that sound good, good to everybody? All right, let's do it. We'll see you back here in 10 minutes. I'll set a timer and then when it gets time, I'll just pull everybody back. So um, we'll see you back here. Enjoy your rooms. Yeah. Hey, welcome back from the breakout rooms. Hope you had some nice conversations and got to meet each other. Um, awesome. So yeah, we'll open a few people up. multiplied. Yeah, yeah we, we, we gained a few people in the meantime. Um, so maybe we can kick it off. Um, jo just hopped in and she wasn't in a breakout room. So we had her um, define a DAO and she said it was, can you repeat what you said, Joe? And then maybe we can. Uh, so my, my one sentence yep. is uh, a, DAO is a self-sustaining tribe. Tribe in the in the real indigenous sense of the you know human tribe and everything that that entails. Mm -hmm. And you were mentioning that it's the human component and the relationships and even having elders there to help guide and things. It's, I think it's that's as, really as well as thing. houses and plumbing and infrastructure and you know like places to hunt and food to eat and you know like all levels. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So in your breakout rooms, does anybody have things that stood out? Things that made you go, oh, I didn't think about that, or things that you just want to bring to this conversation about? distributed autonomous organizations? Um, I think I we had two. Be, yeah. Oh, go sorry, ahead. go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I was just going to say that in our uh, breakout room, I, I think there was kind of um, two different kinds of way. Yeah, first of all, there were, uh, people who have been burdened by the original DAO, I think we can hear, hear about that, um, but the, 
notion that um, DAOs um, can be both very nebulous and described in such a way that you could never kind of implement them down to very specific. And having um, had a lot of experience myself in designing and developing DAOs, you know, I, I you know run into the walls that uh, the, the the limitations that you have, and how to develop them so that there is an on-chain component that carries the DAO forward and an off-chain component that deals with um, people's relationships and establishing uh, collective intentions. That's great. Yeah, in breakout room one, uh, the main thing that stood out to me is that everybody's from Victoria, British Columbia, which is where I'm from. No, um, that was just a cool coincidence. Um, I'm based in Japan now, so it was kind of neat to, to connect back with you lovely island folks. Um, I think the main thing we discussed, it kind of centered around the relationship between sort of AI and technical systems and then humanity and what that relationship is and how DAOs are either an attempt to redefine that relationship or to create something, an entirely new definition of what that is, including maybe even removing the human part um, of humanity or humane futures. So uh, I'm sure other folks in the group could talk more about that, but it was sort of centered around that, about what role does humanity play or what role do humans play in humanity going forward? Well, I'd, I'd love to hear what Thomas has to say. He's been doing thumbs up when, <laughs> when Drew said, let's remove humanity. There was a big smile and thumbs up. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Thomas uh, from Victoria. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, pioneering creation of uh, the next stage of venture capital, uh, VC 3.0, in which we're incorporating the DAO. Uh, as the organization. So my definition of DAO is a practical approach in creating a humane future for humanity by crossing out the word human in the word humane. Thank you. That's not enough. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so one of the challenges that, that I personally see is when we have human beings uh, overruling and controlling other human beings, um, there's going to be problems. So I see a future when we can have AIs and robots and uh, DAOs uh, controlling and managing all of us. And I feel and I believe that that would be a much more humane future for humanity. Wow. There you go. Yeah, that's pretty intense. <laughs> it depends who is going to write the what kind of bias is kind of put into the AI. So it's there's still some human component. Yeah. Humans have to set it up, and then when things start turning left and right, humans have to maintain it. <laughs> or are we gonna let the code, the smart contract? go on its merry way, no matter what happens to the humans. Yeah, what, one thing I did to admit is I believe in something called the super consciousness. So I feel that as humanity, human beings, we evolve, we're going to develop a higher form of consciousness that will allow us to all coexist together in harmony. And uh, I think uh, Tao is a practical building block in getting us there. So Thomas, are you talking about a technological post singularity kind of a thing? Or is Absolutely. it something completely different? Yeah, it's uh, ultimately singularity. Yeah, post singularity. <clears throat> I call it the shared collective consciousness, right? Um, if, uh, and it's, it's a, a kind of a consciousness beyond what we think of in terms of consciousness and conceive as consciousness at the individual human level or an individual creature level but if uh, a blockchain is nothing but a um, record of uh, all of the you know there's right now it's just movements of value transactions but over time as transactions become richer with more metadata um, and uh, we evolve towards this um um cybernetic future um then with the advancement of machine learning models ais 
and networks of AIs and AIs working together and collaborating on, you know, we already have our memories in the um, blockchain and the metaverse. Now, if the AIs can operate on that, then we can evolve towards a shared collective consciousness. So I, for one, welcome our cybernetic overlords. People think of uh, the singularity as dystopian. Um, you know, I think of the singularity as this um, harmony. Peter, you came off mute. Do you have thoughts on this? I have a lot of thoughts, but like, um, so, um, you know, I don't know, like some people in my life have very strong opinions and, and um, always know what they believe and what they think. And I tend to be one of those people that like, depending on what I've read or where I've talked to that day, I've suddenly changed every, my whole worldview. And like, um, and uh, so, yeah, I was at one time, you know, when I first started reading about the singularity, like maybe about 15 years ago, I was like, yeah, sign me up. This is going to be awesome. Like, um, and then, um, you know, also got very much into like the spiritual aspect of that concept and, you know, ideas about, you know, the, the realm that we live in right now that our five senses and, and instrumentation can detect, like there's a lot more going on. I mean, yeah, we just know there is uh, just if even if it's just through physics. Um, and so, I'm, you know, but I've got more recently, I've gotten to the point where I started to realize my own techno solution as biases and things. And that um, that I like the idea of being able to, and it makes me feel powerful to think I can create technology that can work towards something like that. And whether I'm not 100% sure that's a healthy thing and or even desirable, um, but it's also kind of inevitable, like it's just kind of happening. So uh, it's kind of hard to square that circle sometimes, but to bring it back to the Dow conversation, like I was saying in our breakout too, and I've said a few times as people talking about this over the last couple of weeks, is that like, I, again, when I heard about the Dow a few years ago, I was like, fantastic, sign me up. Like, this is exactly what we need. Like I got, in, I'm involved in blockchain. I got involved and I'm still involved in blockchain because, you know, I believe in like decentralizing power. I, I, I think that's what this movement, if it's a movement is, is that's what it's about. It's not about getting rich or like selling board apes. It's about like, um, you know, uh, and, and empowering every like sentient being on this planet and saving this planet from ourselves from the, the or, or sorry, from the, minor, the small minority who we've given centralized power to and who are corrupted by it and who are ruining it for everybody else. And so I see there is a technological, like I believe there in, within blockchain technology and so-called Web3 technology, there are the fundamentals for building that, that an infrastructure that can deliver something that's not dystopian. Um, but now I'm concerned that the way that we're seeing DAOs being implemented. So when I, when I, whenever I thought of a DAO, I thought of it like, um, again, I, I, you know, everybody can touch an elephant. I can feel an ear, you can feel a tail, like somebody else feels a leg. We're all feeling an elephant, but we're all talking about something different. And I started to realize that I had projected my own biases on what I thought of as a DAO. And I thought that the video you opened with was, was awesome for that, uh, to kind of highlight that again as well. And so for myself, I've always, I, you know, I kind of harbor these kind of like anarchist idealist kind of like, uh, constant, not like anarchists as in burn everything down and start over, but anarchists as in like, let's move power to the edges. Let's, con let's, let's not like, where there's Ill illegitimate centralized power, let's confront that and change that. Let's, um, you know, let's have shared governance. Let's have, let's give individuals power and freedom and autonomy. Um, and let's in provide, create a system where that's possible. And so for me, it was like every, you know, all this talk about a DAO, a DAO, like, you know, including my own projects in, that are funded by Catalyst, it's like, okay, we're going to go through gradual decentralization and then we hand this off to a DAO. And then, then we hand this off to a DAO. It's been like this thing that we talked about for a number of years in our community and everybody's got their own idea of like what happens when then you hand it off to a DAO. And for me, it was always like this kind of like anarchist, um, I, like utopia where everybody was self-empowered and was, um, you know, was, was in, in able to like, reach their own self-fulfillment through us putting something in place that allowed for that. And then, you know, Dan Olson's video that we watched as kind of homework for last our last meeting kind of challenged that concept of a DAO and said, what the hell are you doing? Like, why would you enforce these like rules on human conduct into something that is immutable and you can't change because human, con human relationships are so slippery and constantly changing. Why would you want to do that? Like, why would you want to force you, paint yourself into a corner like that? 
um, humans are, we, we're, we're doing it right now, we're having a discussion and you know, there's no way any of us could anticipate this discussion and put it into a smart contract and program the, the discussion to come out of a, out of a, of a software application. So it's like, why would we do that? Why would we do that to uh, restrict ourselves like that? And, you know, and then Dan's point was like, well, you know, we already have things that work like foundations and trusts and, you know, co-ops and all these smart contracts seem to defer to some off chain mediation at some point anyway, that would use some structure like that. So why don't we just keep using those structures and why do we need to put hard code rules into a smart contract to make that happen? So again, I'm like, you know, uh, I'll probably change my mind about this tomorrow, but right now I'm a little bit, I've, I've become a little bit more skeptical. Like, you know, you, you, see, you, see, you see things in the mainstream crypto news, like the constitution DAO, right? Like people kind of abusing the concept of a DAO. And yeah, yeah, I was one of the, I was one of the original victims of the DAO hack. Like I was into this way back then and I was an idealist and joined it for those reasons. Um, but like only recently have I started to kind of like, but I was okay with that. I was like, okay, that was just, or that was just the first time around. It was an early experiment that failed. That's okay. It's, it's going to, it's going to get better. We'll figure this out. But I'm starting to realize maybe we haven't figured it out. And, but that's, you know, I talked to Dan in our breakout group and Dan had, has some really positive experience and it's, it's in the, his project it's worked out. So again, I'm, I'll just be quiet now and listen to some other people, but that's, you know, I don't really like, again, I'm just kind of all over the map, which just tends to be me usually most of the time. So. And then before we go to Ray, Matthias, you had your hand up. Did you want to say something? Um, I, I think I have as much to say about this topic as Peter, because I just wrote a 46 page white paper on the conflict aspect. Um, so I'll listen for now and maybe uh, hint at something that'll happen in Catalyst later. Okay, thank you. Ray, um, your hand is up. I like what Peter said, that was really good. <laughs> I know you're kind of going a little bit like this, but still that's based on reality, what you were saying in, this, in the sense of where it's at. But my observation uh, through a lot of research as well is there are currently eight countries in the world who have made this illegal already. China is formally has made this whole thing illegal. They themselves, however, have decided to have their own cryptocurrency, but from the top, the government shall have the cryptocurrency, but nobody else in China is allowed to have anything to do with any blockchain, any smart contracts, nothing. And I also just read that last week, Russia, their central bank is adamant about making all of this completely illegal in Russia. So that's a top down. So there's an idealistic of, oh, this will all be wonderful, but you've got two communist countries saying, no, not in this country, that equipment will not be functioning. And then I just read the thing about what the uh, agencies in the United States are working on. It's a lengthy article. Uh, supposedly it's being set up so that Biden will do an announcement. They now think it will be this next week, but, Every major agency within the United States, the financial, the security agencies, the FBI, the CIA, I've been basically working on what are we going to do about all this? And the other part is how are we going to legislate this? How are we going to control this? And how do we get taxes out of it? So it's idealistic to say, gee, this is wonderful. We're going to have this, you know, nobody's in control and everybody gets to participate. But the fact of the matter is, even the United States, from all levels, and I could pull the document up and you could see all the different agencies that are involved, they're all working on how do they control it from the top. So we're going to wind up with, it's a great idealistic utopian concept, but even the United States is going to put a very heavy hand on controlling how this stuff gets used. And that's just, that's current. But apparently he's making the announcement next week and all the agencies that are involved are fabricating or formulating what will be in that announcement. But basically the announcement is that officially as an executive order from the point of the president of the United States, he's ordering every agency to do their own research and to fit figure out how those agencies will govern and control this thing called blockchain 
this thing called smart contracts, this thing called currents, uh, cryptocurrencies? How does the government gain control of all of this? But the other part is because there's another document out there or a website that I was reading, as we probably all know, the amount of theft in this space is in the trillions. So over the last 10 years, it's in the trillions of dollars have been stolen all over the world. And so the other part that they're concerned about is that this system is flawed from all angles. And just this last week, right, there was this couple out of Florida, $4 billion they stole. And then every time you turn around, there's another billion here, there's another three or 400 million here, there's another 30 million there. So whether it's the metaverse, which is basically 3D virtual reality worlds, that's what the metaverse is. So whether you're making money in that area or in the NFT area or in the DeFi area, or you're involved in some kind of a DAO situation, there's a lot of flaws still in all the programming. And there's another agency, which is an investigative agency. An article came out by those guys that agency's clients are the FBI, the CIA, um, and the other uh, investigative agency of the United States. That's who that, that's who that organization has as clients. What they've been doing is investigating already, where's all the theft coming from? And so even though it's blockchain decentralized and supposedly nobody's supposed to know where anything is coming from and the decentralized side of all this, the fact of the matter is they are following it. And what they've discovered is that most of the thefts are coming from Russia, North Korea, China, and the Middle East. So there are organized criminal organizations who are taking advantage of all of this stuff. And as we know with the NFTs, it's so easy to do wash trading, if you know what that is, with robots. So they'll set up a project and this, oh, this can be done with DAOs as well. Bring it right back to the DAO conversation. You can create a, um, a uh, contract, set up a project for an NFT, and then do what's called wash trading with robots. So they're trading automatically increasing the price. And the website with its roadmap and its white paper is all fantasy and fiction. But for the non-informed, they're all excited because, oh, look at these pictures. I'm gonna make all kinds of money. But meanwhile, it's computers that are pushing the prices up. And then the non-informed come in and start spending their money. And then they do what is called a rug pull. And the end result is somebody's making $100 million. And the people who are left holding the bag are the people who didn't know they just got scammed. That stuff's still going on. And as we know, in, in uh, OpenSea, if you saw that article, that just happened last week, right? 17 people had their NFTs taken, swiped right out of their, uh, their wallets. And then those NFTs were sold somewhere else for about 2 million bucks, a little over 2 million, right, in, right around 2 million. That just happened last week. Now there's a lot of, stuff on blockchain we talked about it last time about the negative downsides and the the scams and the frauds and things and i think it's still that's very healthy um to be aware of so yeah thanks ray brian your hand is up uh yeah just some um, to respond to some of those comments and also things other people have said um i don't know that uh off blockchain is very different in terms of the criminal element. So that's, in a way, it, it's not new. Um, but the, I find an interesting twist of in what um, Kathy raised in our breakout room about what was happening recently in Canada with the truckers in Ottawa. I think it's a really interesting situation for and potentially promising for blockchain and DAOs. Uh, what happened was there was a protest the government declared a state of emergency to remove the protest. Um, and then a couple of things happened. They froze the accounts 
the bank accounts of anyone who donated even ten dollars to the truckers to the uh, in in Ottawa, and they gave instructions to the banks to do this. So. Um, where I find this interesting, it, this intersects with both uh, blockchain as a currency and also as DAOs. Uh, if those donations had been made through a cryptocurrency um, and the individuals were holding their own wallets, not in an exchange, then it, freezing accounts would simply be impossible. Um, now, the other part that where DAOs come in, and I don't know much about DAOs, but in my imagination, um, if a DAO is something like a company or a co-op that can operate where the rules are enforced by the blockchain rather than by a, a legal system and a government, um, then an organization like Give, Send, Go could theoretically operate uh, insulated from the Canadian government telling it, hey, you have to freeze these funds. Um, right now, Give, Send, Go or similar um, basically have to do whatever their government tells them because they're within that jurisdiction. Uh, I, one of the questions on my mind is if those organizations were DAOs where there's no one central location, the rules are on the blockchain, could they withstand the governments making edicts like you must steal this person's money from their account? Interesting. Thanks for that, Brian. Um, Tevo, your hand is up. Yeah, uh, following what Ray said, I, one part, of course, is that um, the, the criminality, what's going on, but I feel like this is actually easier to, to spot and, and to follow compared to actual fiat scams or these uh, Amazon uh, scams or like what they do with like a take your bank account and then they do this like team viewers hacks and I think this is like a common theme what's going on a lot in this Middle East Russia and the Chinese side which they have the technical capability to do it mm, the cryptocurrency is such a novel thing so criminals usually are always on top of uh, things in order to capture that and take advantage of that. So my, my counter to this is the only way I see is the education. So when we don't, I'm not even aware that there is a blockchain education in schools or how to be aware of scams and how to even invest, how to understand investing, because now it's literally kids can do it very easily, but that education aspect is not there. So. If there is anybody who's like watching it and is in the legislation side, I think that has to be like started from there, like make aware of how the system works and how to use it um, uh, like in, in, a, in a human way and, and, not, and not get burned and understand where you're, what can you do with your money? Because current system as we are, in this uh, monetary system, it, the money has the power. So when you kind of vote with your money mainly, uh, and so it has to be understood that now when you change your money into digital value now, which is the blockchain gives us and move it across the chain, which is like uh, moving trust uh, around the chain, then you better than know what you're doing with it and how to use it. Thanks, Devo. And before we move to Jeremy, I just wanted to prime Joe to speak at some point. I know you're involved with a lot of different groups that are experimenting with different ways of human collaboration. Like um, I know you're somehow related with like Inspiral and a few other places. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the human collaboration part of DAOs at some point, um, if you're willing to share something there. Um, sure. Okay, I don't want to put you on the spot now, so I'll let Jeremy go while you collect your thoughts. All right, Jeremy. Thanks, Nori. I was just going to follow up on um, the comment about education, just saying um, I, I agree that that's a really vital point. 
uh, one of the things that triggered is also is Fletcher's in the in the meeting now, and I know Fletcher does a lot of Cardano education through meetups. Um, and there's actually starting to be sort of an informal working group in Cardano uh, around education that we started with um, WADA and some education groups from Latin America and also from um, Asia. And we're trying to figure out ways to um, help each other and collaborate um, so that we're not all sort of reinventing the wheel when it comes to education. Anyways, just a quick comment about that. Jeremy, uh, with yes, and then we can bring Joe in. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you want to start? Please go ahead. I'll be there afterward. <laughs> cool. Um, segue from from um, education. Um, I, I'm I've lived in the UK and then Australia and New Zealand and about even amount of time in each <clears throat> at different stages of my life, though, <laughs> obviously. And in none of those countries have we had good education about the systems of coordination that we've been working with for the last decades. Like we haven't educated well about civics, how to participate in government, how to, you know, be part of your local council, be even part of the PTA, <laughs> right? Like we... We're just, we're just, humans are just bad <laughs> at sharing the information, right? And, and um, when it comes to actually working with each other, when it comes to working with tools or building something, we pass on that knowledge, right? Like we, we can build a house, we get better at building houses and we can build a plane and we can do all of that stuff. When it comes to actually working with each other, it's, you know, tremendously difficult. So, um, yeah, education is is a problem, but I don't think it's the education system. I think it, it, it is, back to Nori's point and, and what you asked me to speak about, it is about relationship building. And I'm very, very fortunate and extremely privileged to have ended up in New Zealand um, for lots of different reasons. <laughs> um, one, one being that it's a... It's a small country, right? There's only five million of us here, right? So we have a we have a telco called um, Two Degrees in New Zealand because literally we're two degrees away from everybody. Like I'm two two degrees away from the prime minister, you know. Like it's really not that hard <laughs> to get in contact with anybody. And so, and that, that brings uh, benefits and it brings challenges. One of the benefits is that you can be in touch with anybody, right? Which means that you have some, you know, there's some influence attached to those numbers, right? That, that um, degree of separation that we have from each other. But the, the, one of the downsides of it is that it's hard to um, experiment with some kind of way out ideas that might piss some other people off because you're only two degrees away from each other, <laughs> right? So the, the level of innovation, um, the speed of innovation is regulated by our proximity to each other and our ability to communicate. And in Spiral, along with a whole load of other organizations, they, they are um, kind, of kind of disbanded, not really, but kind of, because they're still a, they're still a band and, you know, they're still very connected like a family, but they've kind of stopped their operations as such, got rid of their co-working space. Um, there's lots of businesses that grew out of it. They are, they are one of the groups that um, has gone international with their, their, um, their tools for educating people how to work together helping people work together, how to build relationships with each other really well. And, and some of it, not all of it, but some of it is grounded in the, um, the indigenous people of, of New Zealand, which is the, the, um, the Māori people, which again, I'm very privileged to be um, 
married into the whānau, which is which means family here in in New Zealand. So my my children are um, Māori descendants, and um, there's a there's a core thing at the bottom of Inspiral, the other organisations, and Māori, which is around um, mana, which is a concept of treating each other you know, as you want, want to be treated, you know, being kind. Um, and um, aroha is the other one. And aroha is, you know, is, these are philosophical concepts, right, around love for, love for life and everything that, it, that exists, right, and treasuring that and stewarding that. So at the bottom of our politics, our telco, in spiral as an entrepreneurial organization, our families, our constructs, um, is this general, these two concepts, mana and, and aroha, that, that help New Zealanders, certainly, as I say, I'm very privileged to be surrounded by them, work together really well. So the concept of a DAO is landing well in New Zealand. Um, the concept of, I shared a tweet yesterday from somebody around um, what happens when um, a DAO, and I think it was called the Builder DAO, gets past its original kind of exciting stage where everybody's going, we're building a DAO, we're building a DAO. And they talked about having rituals and um, getting to know each other really well. And all of that echoes the experience here and, and the things that come out of, out of New Zealand. Um, and in, in Te Ao Māori, which means in Māori worldview, that's tikanga, that's traditions, that's rituals. Um, you know, you go away and you meet each other and you understand which, where each other is coming from before you get into a conversation about something you've got to decide about, you know. So, um, yeah, a bit of a ramble, but it, you know, it all comes down to those two concepts for me, which are very human concepts. So taking the human out is challenging for me. <laughs> that's, that's interesting because you mentioned that DAOs is a, a familiar or comfortable concept for the Maori worldview. I wonder if there's lessons or things to be taken from that or other indigenous cultures that you mentioned tribe before. And are there things there that we could be learning on how humans operated before that we can apply into this new space? Um, you know. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Matthias? Yeah, thank you, Joe. And also Peter posted some very uh, insightful comments in the chat. So I feel already inadequate and in saying anything. So might as well say anything. Um, but what I posted in the chat is actually a Google document. Um, and uh, the reason for this is that, um, so this is a, a uh, Fund9 challenge uh, proposal. Uh, sorry, challenge setting proposal to be posted in fund aid. So within 12 hours or so. And um, the reason for that is why this connects in, in this discussion is then when I was in a breakout room and it was before Tebo's uh, profound statement that Catalyst is a DAO, right? I described uh, a little bit uh, maybe contrarian uh, that a DAO to me is a novel unstructured type of organization. And the, the key point is essentially uninformed voting on things people don't understand. And it's rife with conflict, something along those lines, right? Uh, which I've personally experienced in Catalyst as well. Um, so I believe, and why I personally find, you know, the uh, uh, discussions on AI, AI to AI conflict, potentially mediated by another AI, throwing in some humans and other life forms. And it's very interesting. I believe that we as a community have a uh, chance to really use the conflicts that have increasingly shown up within us, uh, within the greater Cardano community uh, and also the blockchain space and the real world and make a focused effort on um, 
transforming these conflicts. And uh, so conflict transformation is also something that borrows um, also from indigenous uh, practices as well, indigenous peacemaking um, movements. So I encourage anyone to uh, try and uh, either co-propose, support this in any way they can. Um, I think that is an important proposal. Thanks, Matthias. Drew, you want to hop in with some thoughts? Sure, yeah. I see that uh, it looks like Peter and folks are already kind of talking more about this in the chat. So forgive me if I'm going over something we've already talked about. Um, but as Joe mentioned, sort of the two degrees of separation, Kyoto is very much a similar environment, especially if you're uh, a foreigner or expat living here. Um, everybody knows everybody. And that can be very frustrating for people um, because it seems like as soon as you do anything, everyone already knows about it. Reputation is a really big issue here. So if you do something that damages your reputation, that can harm your livelihood and stuff. Um, there's some downsides to it, but I actually really like it. And the reason I like it is because there is an inherent understanding that your actions will reach everyone. You can't really hide in anonymity. You will affect your community and that will reflect back on you. So what it does is that it's basically like an, an asshole filter for the most part. Most people are generally pretty kind um, and pretty, um, even if they have their own sort of motive um, and it's self-interested, they still understand that they have to still work within a communal system that they can't be a, a sociopath. It'll come back. So it kind of filters those types of people out and encourages better collaboration. Um, of course, the hurdle for collaboration is quite high to be accepted, but it does have some benefits. So I'm trying to, without rambling too much, I'm trying to, I think I have an idea here. Um, but anyway, so how do we um, maintain those sorts of systems where by rather than spreading out infinitely, we're actually bringing people back into a tighter community somehow, even in a decentralized way, but we have those strong communal connections where um, things like we have psychological safety to share ideas together. We have self-enforcement mechanisms that are maybe cultural or community-based that aren't hard prescribed laws um, that don't have the ability to be enforced. Um, so how can we create community, strengthen connections, and actually increase our ability to collaborate. And then the question was that I'm, I'm reacting to, which is why I raised my hand, was Peter mentioned, um, can DAOs scale? Um, and my then I raised my hand, and then now I see that you've gone on to expand on that thought a lot more. Should DAOs scale is maybe a, an important question, because what you're saying exactly right, at, well, that was my first reaction. And what you say is, um, one human can only maintain about 150 relationships there's some evidence to suggest that. So yeah, thinking about it more in terms of tribes or um, smaller, so, smaller subunits might be effective. So can we create a framework of DAOs that this, the overall framework, the overall mesh scales effectively to be able to challenge or address global challenges or larger problems, but that the unit that you interact with that mesh is um, a healthy size for community relationships. Um, and certainly taking traditional wisdom in how we structure this, I think, is critical um, for the reason I described before about <laughs> Kyoto. And I nominate, Nori, that your cat should be the head of this. So we should centralize all power in the, head, in the hands of your cat. He's got and the all follow. <laughs> there all we go. The cat. I'm, in. I'm in. Yeah. Um, OK, so and then I apologize in my in, in the great asshole filter. Yes, exactly. Um, right, OK, so it seems like people are already talk, talking about this in the chat, so I'll, I'll relinquish my conch but that's just what i wanted to say yeah thanks Drew. and i think that's a really good thing to keep in mind um dunbar's limit has come up several times today in different conversations and people talk about that a lot um but we're also scaling to billions of people ideally so what does that mean um how do groups of 150 collaborate together um that's an interesting question um agape pool you want to jump? Yeah, just uh, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I live in uh, Manitoba. Our internet's not the greatest, so 
bear with me if I start sounding like, yeah, a robot. Yeah, my name's Brock. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on, uh, I think it was Thomas was talking a little bit earlier and uh, about uh, AI and, and I really appreciated his comments because it helped me to articulate a little bit more of my view of a DAO uh, because just generalized, I kind of say that it's just an autonomous business that is run where basically more of what I meant was more along the lines of what Joe had mentioned, how you would structure the business if it's a specific, uh, if it has specific goals in mind to attain those goals and try to eliminate the human elements that usually corrupt or spoil those goals for a business with like greed or power and be able to eliminate that uh, equation out of the business and then allow decisions uh, being, being made, uh, give that to the community that will have the best interests of everyone in, in mind because ultimately I believe that all of us are part of our own little tribes and we're trying to build that good family type relationship everywhere we go uh, by the way we conduct ourselves or transact. So I thought that was very cool to be a part of the conversation and be able to kind of structure in my mind a little bit clearer just exactly what a DAO means and be, be able to project that more accurately instead of making it sound like, oh, it's just a robotic type thing. It's the intention is to eliminate the negative human elements and accentuate the ability to actually deliver on its objective while not taking out the human element as well. Thanks, Brock. That was, I think part of this is coming together so we can get a little more clarity amongst ourselves about what this whole concept is. And I love the conversation because it is totally revamping what I think. And I swing back and forth from like Peter says, like this idealistic view to this, oh my God, this is gonna ruin our lives. And, hopping back and forth. So yeah, hearing all these viewpoints is really awesome. Um, Dimitri. Dimitri is joining us from Sri Lanka. So he's probably traveled the furthest to be here. Yeah, so first of all, um, I don't think Catalyst is a DAO. I don't think at the moment it is. Maybe it is working towards. But to me, it seems like it's still highly controlled and centralized. Um, I also think that the speed it's moving towards being a DAO is too slow. Um, so that's a different thing. So that was one thing. So I was interested to hear that uh, Tevo had said that it was a DAO already, but I don't think. Um, secondly, in terms of uh, it being uh, of DAOs in general, I don't think anything should be hard coded and made permanent forever because that's certainly going to exclude someone. Um, who contradicts the narrative uh, dictated by whoever set it in place at the beginning. Uh, also considering that I don't think anybody, even a group of 10 people can necessarily come up with a consensus that all of them will believe forever and ever, amen, for the rest of time about anything. Because uh, so if 10 people are not going to make up their minds on something forever, it's unlikely that a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 or a million people will ever make up their minds. Let everyone be happy. So if a DAO can be made whereby uh, uh, some sort of elective process happens and people can decide on certain things based on some criteria, or maybe that is contradictory to the nature of a DAO, but anything where rules are written in stone ultimately is going to be broken by a revolution of some sort or the other. It could be bloody, it could be bloodless, but either way, uh, the whole idea of aristocracy was that this thing was set in stone. Uh, it's a, it's a, aristocracy is essentially a hard coding of a DAO. There was a group of people 
they collectively decided that one family is going to make decisions for them. Let's call them the, uh, the hard-coded uh, uh, part. And that family decided that forever and ever, they are going to make the rules. And basically, they, the aristocracy, generally speaking, uh, lived a life that was advantageous to themselves and generally disadvantageous to everybody else. And the people who gained advantage were the people like the nobility who, uh, uh, who basically structured so that they endeared themselves to the aristocracy and uh, took advantage of the, uh, the serfs. So uh, the whole idea of aristocracy itself is a kind of what can happen in a human context if anything is hard-coded. So uh, democracy in all its flaws, I think, is a better option than anything being hard-coded. Uh, true enough, uh, blockchain is good for a lot of things, but I don't think it should be taken to replace humans uh, in this way. Uh, thirdly, in regard to the idea of AIs being uh, great and you know this idealistic idea, I'm strongly against that because I don't think anything without a soul can be truly able to understand and govern. Uh, and anything without a soul is definitely going to have uh, its programmers, uh, attitudes, consciousness, and all that in mind. Uh, so that's what I have to say about that. Thanks, Dimitri. It's nice to hear the other side. Um, and yeah, I would love to hear what others think about that. Um, Joe, you have your hand up. Um, you're muted. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I want to pick up on a, a couple of things that Dimitri just said now, because they've usurped everything that I was going to say before. <laughs> One thing is, um, is the hard coding thing, right? Like, I think, I think there are certain concepts that, that you, that you can't defi define collectively, <laughs> right? Like everybody has, like, God, right? Everybody has their own interpretation of what that is, right? Or soul or whatever. But there are the primitives that are reusable in lots of different different ways, like like be good to each other, like look after <laughs> planet Earth, like, you know, they're primitives that should be part of everything. Um, so when we talk about speed and can we scale and you know like what's the efficiency of of this thing it kind of feels like they're the wrong wrong things to strive for you know like it's have we got something that's useful to help people coordinate their efforts to achieve something has it got a has it got a label um does it have to be called a DAO or is it just it's a piece of software that's useful? Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I just through this conversation <laughs> and so many different viewpoints, I'm kind of struggling with, you know, this is what a DAO is. Mm -hmm. Not it's even kind of like, kind of like Web3 is when you're saying that, Joe, it makes me realize I'm, yeah, it's like, you know, like I said earlier, it's like we all we, we all kept saying and we we're like, yeah, that's what we want. That's what we mean. And suddenly we're like, oh, wait, what well, your thing is not quite my thing. And like and then, you know, in good system design, you you have functional specifications. You say what the software will do, not what it's called, like just like what does if, you know, instead of saying a DAO, it's like, well, I want meaningful human relationships and I want a way to organize resources. So I want people have been saying these functional statements throughout this call. Um, and it's like, yeah, maybe we should just throw out the label DAO. Like maybe it's just become a, a distraction. Like it's, that's what it sounded like to me anyway. Sorry, I'm sorry, other people have their hands up, but it's just a quick thought. Thanks, Peter. One no. option is that the DAO itself is in a function. So uh, about this uh, decentralized part, what I think it could be and should be hard-coded into uh, these decisions and function, which you these people who follow this DAO want to follow and they want that all the others who join kind of also follow the rules and are not able to break them and and if you change your mind which people often do you can just take your wallet and move out if it's like a construction or you you stand with your feet pretty much that's the the case 
and you walk with your feet. So you just change the DAO into what your mind is now. So probably you will see Peter every day. He's in a, in a different DAO because he just can't make it up his mind. <laughs> Uh, on an other note, uh, I wanted to answer, uh, I don't know who, who came up with it, but the, the reputation side, uh, like, um, I think, yes, we're going to have a danger in Psyhopets who are going to play nice at early games uh, and like do the good deeds to gain the traction, to get the, the, the recognition and the digital reputation in a sense, and at some point make a Awful decision which takes us like a few steps back and it's going to probably happen several times ago and i like the concept like anti-fragility what was a few weeks ago shared in an after downhole and i think this is what we kind of have to live with that we are gonna have this kind of situation and and i, I think we haven't really lived through that yet but it's going to uh, happen but another side of the reputation is that this since we are at least i grow up with gaming and um, playing uh, in like role-playing games in like mostly multi multiplayer games and there is a lot of like these reputation concepts already kind of work where you you don't get negative points when you do something so you are not uh, you, you, you are encouraged to try out new things and invent and, and just make mistakes. And, and another side that this reputation has to over time kind of get lower. So what you're going to reach is the threshold so that if every week you're doing good deeds, then you are kind of in the top of the list. And but in, to grow there, it takes maybe months or maybe even a year to get in the top of the list. But as soon as you do that so-called psycho psychopathic move, then you do not get any points because nobody's like, God damn it, this decision you made and just was crap. And you do not get the, uh, the points or reputation in this round. So in the next scenario, you're already a step lower. So you cannot like repeat crushing the system with your decision making. But yeah, that's the game theory. Thanks, Devil. I think that's an actually a really good point. Is um, a lot of us grew up playing role playing games like World of Warcraft or whatever, and there were guilds. And in my mind, DAOs are a little bit like those guilds where a bunch of people come together and we need to go slay this dragon, and we try all these different things and eventually get there. And 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 all these systems are how to divide up the treasure and the dkps and all that kind of stuff is a fascinating kind of subculture that maybe we need to look at as well and maybe experiment with um dan your hand is up yeah i guess um i think that game um uh analogy that you just uh, laid out is a good example um it's really about building community and about uh finding people that have collective interests. I mean, what we're doing right now, we have 10 or 12 people together talking and by having a chance to you know, share our discussion, we're all in our individual minds gathering, what meanings, you know, what, what, what does this group mean to me? You know, or, or we're, we're kind of collecting our shared meanings. Once you do that and you kind of coalesce around a group of people that have a common set of interests, then you can start working on your intentions. What are people wanting to do from their intentions? And this is way before there's any kind of DAO structure that would, I, I think of a DAO as just something to help us execute on things that we decide together. But there are some very good ways um, that we're working on to try to coordinate that collaborative um, in, engagement such that we collect the, the um, shared intentions of a group and then turn those slowly into projects, into collaborative um, you know, actions that we each take and maybe we coordinate ourselves. And the, the DAO is really just something to, to help us. Um, it's you know, um, a, a kind of a coordination mechanism. You know, the only real coordination mechanism we have now in, in, the, in this world that we've had for many years is money. Money is a way of coordinating you know, people by giving them incentives to do certain things and not. And so I think every, every community, I think DAO should be structured around community and that communities 
organize themselves both through making decisions, so where that's knowledge is power, and through taking actions and spending money, the community should have money to help coordinate our actions. And we spend that money collectively to execute on, on the things that we wanna do. So there is an example where money is power. So knowledge and power and money is power in coordinating uh, communities. Um, I think that's where it comes from. The communities grow and grow and, and they establish um, relationships with other communities, but um, I think we're coming at it from the wrong direction. If we think the whole world is going to somehow um, boil down into some DAOs that we all agree on and to try to execute on, um, you know, I think it has to come from within people. And all of, most of the stuff is off chain. It's still human. It's still human talking to human. And um, but we can have and build tools that help coordinate the exchange of. Um, you know, the agreements that we make, the intentions that we, we come to agree upon, and the, the currencies that we exchange in order to enable and to encourage and incentivize the, the actions within communities. It can happen all the way from the level of a, you know, tiny business to, you know, literally it could be a nation state, but I think it's probably going to be a gathering around collective interests. So, um, you know, that's the work that I'm I've been engaged in for quite some time now. We have a project um, I should just mention. Uh, it's called freeos.io, F-R-E-E-O.io, F-R-E-E-O-S.io. And um, we've just launched, it's a community currency based on these basic principles. It's not yet a functioning full um, on-chain DAO, but it, it's moving in that direction. And we have a, a foundation that's kind of, and yeah, it's starting out with a group of people, but we, we, um, we launched it and we got 6,000 people sign up right away saying, hey, we like this idea, we want to move ahead, and it'll evolve into something based on these principles, and we call it, um, we call it uh, qualified demarchy, when we kind of control and organize and distribute our, our knowledge, because obviously, well, there's a lot more to be said about it. That, those are my major, my, my major thoughts. Thanks, Dan. Can you drop a link to that in chat? I'm, I'm pretty sure some people would love to take a look and dive deeper. Um, Thomas. You want to go there? Yeah, thank you. Um, to uh, follow up on Dan's comment, uh, thank you, uh, is uh, my thoughts on uh, the how evolution forms. So uh, all of us, all the people assembled here, we are um, comprised of billions of cells together to form a human being. So long time ago, we used to be single-celled organisms and we bumped into each other and started cooperating and started to have different roles, specialization to become the brain cells, the muscle cells, the skin cells. Likewise, I see a future where uh, billions of people through uh, the internet platform of communication form together to create a super consciousness. And I'd like to uh, propose an example, like if, you know, the, they call it the sewer uh, of the internet, 4chan. But if you look at 4chan, that's where the anonymous um, hacking group uh, resides in, and there's no leader, but they collectively decide what to do next. And I personally um, experienced 4chan uh, you know, making fun of some people, but suddenly spring to life and try to save someone who was committing suicide. Um, so that could be a very primitive form of super consciousness. And uh, I think that can grow into something much bigger using building blocks like the internet, the DAO and blockchain. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. And I'm really fascinated about those building blocks. Um, those are kind of what we're talking about. There's been some talk about how much do we put on chain? And if we put it on chain in a smart contract, you can't change that code is deployed. And how do you change it? Um, and I'd really love to understand more, like how do we actually build the DAOs out? I know there's a bunch. Um, Ray, Roy mentioned there were like 800 on Ethereum blockchain or something like that. Um, but 
yeah, do we need to encode everything into the blockchain and smart contracts, or are we just encoding the decision making mechanisms and how we facilitate decision making and consensus um, building? And then once we decide, the humans fill in the gaps, and then the blockchain is used as like a ledger to record what happened so that it can unlock funds or trigger different things to happen. Um, or the other thing I was thinking is the blockchain is a ledger at its basis. And then there were other conversations that we've had previously about multi-asset accounting, where right now most accounting is all about dollars and you have your balance sheet and your income statement. And these are things that matter, but we never account for human capital or the leadership capacity of the team or different things and blockchain allows all sorts of metadata that we could bake in and if we come up with a standard we could start to experience some of these other dimensions of value that we think are worth tracking and then then it's not just about money this tokenomics could be about something else like cooperation or collaboration or other things that we think are um, important to us as a society um, so I think there are things that the DAO will unlock and allow us to do in the future. I'm just really fuzzy on how do we get from now to this far off vision and what are the first steps and how do we build towards that future? Uh, Peter. Yeah, I was just kind of, sorry, I kind of do that. I tend to like get into distracted and start like chatting in the, I think anyway, that's nice about a Zoom call, isn't it? We can talk and we can we're all we're all we're all uh, next gen enough to be able to talk and, and read threads at the same time. But I just wanted to voice my thought is that um, like for me, like my idealism kind of stems from the idea that the majority of humans are fundamentally good and that our 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 government systems are actually designed to like encourage psychopaths to and sociopaths to take to those positions because they're the only ones with thick enough skin. To like be able to take the constant criticism and make decisions that are inherently um, paradoxical or um, you know have have cognitive dissonance and it's like for anybody with empathy um, and those kinds of qualities that we would like to see in leaders um, we've designed our systems to be such that it's really hard for anybody with those qualities to stay in that position for any period of time and so again, I, it comes to me like it's it's like a it's fundamentally flawed governance systems, and they've it just and it's not just because they exist now doesn't mean they need to exist. We we changed forms of government uh, all along, and we've had many many different forms of government. And um, again, going back looking at indigenous cultures, we can see that other forms of like organizing ourselves are easily possible. And this this kind of like you know this is kind of this this falsehood that like oh this is just the way things have worked and this is the best way to organize ourselves you know the, uh, you know through this kind of like capitalist you know neoliberal collapse democracy like so-called democracy delegated rule um so but then so then it's like well great because so my theory is that uh the majority of us are are good and have good intentions and want others to do well um and that we are for the most part driven by fear like all kinds of fear like, and, um, and so a lot of the fear is like, you're going to take what's mine, you're going to, uh, you're threatening my economic security, which is like fear of poverty. Um, and those base instincts are easily manipulated by those same sociopathic people that want control and power. Um, and they will pull the strings that are available to them to do that. And so, you know, like we've seen with Facebook groups and um, you know, you can argue 4chan, yes, they, they've saved people from suicide, but they've also done some really terrible doxing as well, right? And the fact that people can be anonymous like kind of empowers them um and again that's the flip side of like well if you're if you're only two two degrees of separation from everybody like you, you feel like you're 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 being watched by everybody you don't feel any freedom so people love this idea of anonymity the internet now i can be a dog and nobody knows and i can do whatever and say whatever i want isn't that great yes it is great but it also it has all these downsides as well so um so i keep flipping between this idea like i i always summarize it to myself of like you know, there's the wisdom of the crowd. Like when Web 2.0 became a thing, it was like, you know, let let a thousand flowers bloom and like let the wisdom of the crowd speak, and then all all the good in people will come forth, and we will, you know, that was the first wave of like the promise of the internet, right? Like everybody's going to get their own soapbox, and and then all the voices will come together, and then we will go to this like 
you know, then, then the singularity will start from there, right? And it hasn't started yet. So I'm still waiting for the singularity. So it's like uh, the good one. And, um, and then the flip side is like, well, the madness of the mob like continues to rear its head constantly over and over again. And you just have to read the daily news headlines. There's always some example of that where people, even normal people, like even when you think about things like, you know, people that are, you know, your team won the, the cha- won the cup, won the championship. So you leave the stadium and suddenly you start throwing bottles through windows and people that are like, get arrested. Like, I don't know what happened. I just like, it just kind of everybody was doing it. So I did it too. It's like, you know, that, that is part of being human too. And it's like, you know, we, we celebrate indigenous cultures, but we can't deny the fact that they are sometimes very like violent as well. Right. And that they have violent traditions as well. And it's like, and I, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying being human is super complicated. And we, we, it's, you know, to like, I idealize one culture over the other, or one tradition over the other is like another falsehood in my opinion. Like we gotta, we gotta figure out a way to like, like, uh, um, encircle all the complexity of, of what it is to be a human. And I think the very narrow thing that we're calling DAOs these days are like not even close to that. Like, and it's just dangerous to try to represent them as the, the representing that ideal. And um, yeah, so it comes back. So I guess this is this week. I'm not really in favor of DAOs or anything that called a DAO, but I'm in favor of people. I'm in favor of people coming together and, and fighting for a better future. And if, if, if a DAO lets us do that at some point or wherever we call it, like, great, right? Sign me up. Like, I'll, I'll help out with that. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, and I think I'm going to close it at that. Um, we're at our 90-minute mark, and that's usually about the limit of a human attention span. Mm-hmm. Um, we're doing this every two weeks. Um, we don't have a topic for next week, so I just put a link into our Discord server. Um, there's a channel in there called Pacific Town Hall. If you want to jump in and suggest topics or even want to host a session about something, um, we welcome that. Um, barring that, we'll pick something as the core team in the next couple of weeks. And last time it was NFTs and Web 3.0 and all the things wrong with that. Today was about DAOs. Um, next time will be two weeks from today, as Jeremy reminded me. So hope to see a lot of you back again. Um, and yeah, thanks for the great conversations. I think. Um, it was wonderful, and there were so many great viewpoints and, and opinions here that I loved having you all take part. So thanks for being here. Thanks for opening the space, Nori. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Nori. Yep. yep. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good week. Thank yep. you all. Enjoy your week, everybody. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy spending the time with you. This is good. Good way Make to sure spend don't take it. off. Yeah. <laughs> good night, everybody. Good night. Glad you made it, Tivo. Hope you get some more sleep, man. Oh, he's gone. Never mind. <laughs>